Hello? Good morning. Hi. Hi. What's up, what's up? Good morning. Good morning to you. Hi. That's on weird. Good morning. Hi. How y'all doing? How you doing? What's up, what's up, Trey? Hi guys, morning. How you doing? Good morning, good morning. How y'all doing? Hi. Hi, yes it is a beautiful day. It is spectacular here. Some of the nice trees, we got some trees here. When are we going golfing? Liam, what's up, buddy? Maybe soon? We'll get some golf in for the years up. Yes, he does love us so much. Just woke up. Well, good morning. Yes, I do have a fantastic place to walk. I'm out here in the country. Cut myself shaving this morning, looks like. I'm in Missouri. I'm about an hour south of St. Louis in a lovely little town called Farmington. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Texas, really cool. Where's everybody else checking in from? Where are you guys at? <laughs> pray for you, I definitely will pray for you. I will definitely pray for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Liam, I checked my DMs, buddy. I'm not seeing anything. I'm doing well. New Jersey. Where's everybody else at? North Carolina? Texas? Kentucky? I'm from Missouri. Happy Sunday to you. Orlando. I've been to Orlando. Went to Disney World. Did all the other stuff. Pakistan, wow. So it's not good morning for you. What time is it over there? Arizona? <laughs> Liam. Watch your, watch your mouth, sir. <laughs> Illinois? Hey, Susie. Good morning, good morning. Get my gum out here. Connecticut? 6.34 p.m., all right. 9.35. It's 8.34 here, India. Cool, thanks for joining me. Happy Sunday to you too. All right, all right. So let's go ahead and get into today's walk talk. Before I begin, I want to introduce myself to everybody who's new to my ministry. Anytime you see me doing this with the phone, I'm switching hands because I'm actually out getting my daily exercise. And, um, my name is Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. If I had to give you a description um, in regard to what I do as far as ministry is concerned, um, I write about Jesus. I write books, memes, devotionals, stuff on social media. And that's kind of what I do. Quote, quotes, quotes. Who I am, I am not a Christian author in my identity. It's going to be something I talk about today. In today's topic, I'm a child of God. I'm forgiven. I'm holy. I'm righteous. I'm blameless. I'm a new creation. That is who I truly am. 
But um, if I had to, if somebody was just now new to my ministry and I had to tell them, I'd say, I'm a Christian author. So I started doing these walk talks maybe two or three months ago, maybe four months ago, I don't know. But if you want to check out any of my past episodes, you can always just go to my Instagram profile, go over to the IGTV tab, and I think I have 30 or 40 episodes by now. But these are random. I don't schedule them. I think I've scheduled like one. And that type of thing, it just doesn't work for me. I like uh, my ministry to be more spur of the moment, not planned, just kind of, I don't know, easy, <laughs> easy. And I think that is what the gospel is all about. It's it, Jesus came to give you rest. I'm not against organization. I'm not against scheduling. But when we find our identity in trying to keep things scheduled when it comes to ministry and then you get upset about it because you didn't do something or you didn't go someplace, <sighs> there's no rest there. So these walk talks are random. Sometimes I'll announce them if I know I'm going to do one. I'll put it in my in my live. I'll put it in my story so you can check that out. Um, if you don't want to miss one, you can always go to my profile and you can uh, sign up for the notifications. Um, but you're going to get a notification for everything I do on Instagram. That might that might not be your cup of tea. Then again, you might like that. Some people, as soon as I post something, boom, they interact with it. And I know it's because they have the notifications on, which that's very flattering. I appreciate that. I'm glad I can help you. So um, let's talk about a, a couple other things before I begin here. I have no theological training. I did not go to seminary. Um, I'm not a pastor. I am a regular person just like you who would have thought somebody has over a hundred thousand followers on social media on instagram and they're not saying they're smarter than you they're not trying to prove you wrong with everything they post and say and they're not trying to make you feel bad or feel afraid or not good enough um i didn't get that um for a long time until I came to understand the new covenant. But once I began to understand the new covenant, I started to really follow the teachers who, and, and I call them teachers, more air quotes, but really they're just somebody who understands what Jesus has done. When we understand what Jesus has done, which is going to be a lot to do with today's topic, then we don't have to pressure people. We don't have to guilt people. We don't have to compare people. We don't have to be jealous of other gifts. We can just rest in who we are and we can be ourselves. And that all comes with understanding the truth of the new covenant. So I always like to get out from the open that um, I've got a lot of followers, but who cares? Like if I was teaching error, what, what would that matter? I follow personalities on social media that they struggle with quite a bit of error and they've got a lot of followers what matters is the message the message is what matters whether you have five followers or five million what's your message your message your message your message your message same thing at church uh, the message is what matters it doesn't matter how big or small the church is it's the message the message the message you know we hear so many times uh, how are the church is going to survive if nobody goes to the church they shouldn't survive if their message is not about jesus they should fall off. They should go away. And then we need some new covenant teaching. And the new covenant teaching is the message about Christ. So our, our message has to be about Jesus. There can't be any caveats. There can't be any yeah buts. There can't be grace and works added. There can't be any Christ is not enough. So... So that brings me to today's walk talk. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I've got my mind made up before I started doing this walk talk today. I am going to be respectful. I'm going to express my righteous self-controlled nature. And um, I'm not gonna, not going to um, be nasty. 
So there's, there's topics we can talk about that we disagree with and we don't have to insult other people while we're doing it. We don't have to be nasty. There's this person I follow on TikTok. My goodness. And the, <laughs> everything they say is nasty and rude and mean and attacks Christians. And they are a Christian. I see the facade. I know why they do it. They've told me about the background, how they've been so hurt. I get it. But we have to be, um, in the words of a friend of mine, Andrew Farley, we have to be anchored, not angered. And it's okay to be angry. You can be angry. There's another friend of mine who I don't agree with all of their teaching, but they said something the other day that we choose to be angry. Uh, not necessarily. Anger is a feeling. You can be angry. There's nothing wrong with being angry. It is what you do while angry. It is how you express your anger. And, you know, if you're just coming out of some abuse or if you're just coming out of some really difficult things, anger is normal. Feel the anger. Feel it. I'll never tell you don't feel anger. Yeah. Be angry. It's what you do when you're anger, angry. So we don't want to, there are some times where, you know, I just I start typing and I am mad and I'll get it all out. I'll read it and then I delete it because I needed to feel that. I needed to get it out. I needed to be angry, but I didn't need to post it. I didn't need to make a TikTok about it. I didn't need to make a reel. I needed to be angry and not sin. And what would have been really bad is if I get all this out and I attack the people who I disagree with, what good is that? It's not, it's not. And if you look at, um, you know, the people who truly understand the grace of God, rarely do you see this. It still happens to me. I'm not perfect in what I do, but I'm still perfect. So. We want to, and I'm going to get to the to today's walk talk. I'm building up to it. But we, we want to be able to express our feelings in a self-controlled way, even when we're angry. And when you're maturing in this, it, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. It's another person I follow on TikTok. They got on there the other day and they said somebody was arguing back and forth with them. And they said to them, you know what? F you. And they got on TikTok and they said, I don't know if I should even be doing what I'm doing anymore because I just cursed them out and I'm just really distraught right now. They were angry and they made a mistake. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't, that they should stop doing their evangelism on TikTok. The message is great. Y your testimony is awesome. You made a mistake. Move forward. Learn from it. If you do it again, learn from it. If you do it again, learn. This is a maturation process. You're not perfect in what you do. Your actions and attitudes are not always perfect, but who you are is. Okay? Now, switch hands here. As far as a Christian being perfect, how can I say that? That's hard to understand. If I say to you, you are perfect. You, you hear the false humility quite often. Nobody's perfect, Matt. But you are, though. You actually are perfect as a Christian. Explain, please, you're saying? Sometimes you don't need to explain. I'm going to. But there comes a point where you don't argue with people about what the cross has done, the resurrection has done. You say what you mean, mean what you say, and then let it be. Your identity is not found in 
proving who Jesus is to people. How difficult would that be? If I woke up every day and I tried to prove to you that Jesus is who he says he is. Sounds miserable. So when you are in the comments section on social media and somebody's like, nobody's perfect. You're a liar. But we are. Scripture tells us so. We see this in Hebrews chapter 10. By one offering, you have been made perfect. Hebrews 10, 14. Some translations say, by one offering, you are being made perfect, or you are those who are being made holy. Either way, the gospel stands true. And the reason why is, first of all, the original Greek or Aramaic from the book of Hebrews, it doesn't have a connotation of you're doing something to continue to be made perfect. Now, if you look at the rest of the chapter, that's what the Jews were trying to do at the temple. Year after year, offering blood sacrifices in order to be made perfect, but it could never make them perfect. The blood of Jesus actually did. You have been sanctified. You have been made holy. You have been made perfect. This is hard to understand when you grow up in a legalistic church or a community which is very behavior focused because that's how the Jews thought. Legalism, law, behavior, 613 different ways to screw up. But when we repent, repent from that towards grace, toward the gospel, we understand what the cross and the resurrection has done to us, our identity, who we actually are just as we are, and it has made you perfect. How can you possibly be made perfect? Mental Rolodex just going. The only way you could possibly be made perfect is through the blood of Jesus. The blood of the covenant which sanctified them. That's towards the end of Hebrews chapter 10. I think it's verse 29. The blood of the covenant that sanctifies them. That makes them holy. The blood of the covenant. The blood. The blood of Jesus. Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the only possible thing that can make you holy. That can make you perfect. That can make you a child of God. Make you righteous. How many times did he offer his blood? How many times? Once. By one offering. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. Four verses previously before he says you've been made perfect. By one offering. By one offering. You have been sanctified. By one offering, you have been sanctified. Past tense. This is what happens to those who believe in Christ for salvation. Now, if you want to look at the book of Hebrews, even from the translation of not everybody who's reading this is saved, some of the verses which have a continuing on connotation, that's fine. And the reason why is everybody who is reading this letter or having this letter read to them have, have not believed in Jesus. But what will cause them to be sanctified? What will cause them to have once for all forgiveness? If they continue to hear the message about Jesus, if they continue to hear what I'm saying to you, that Jesus is enough, his blood sanctifies you, his blood makes you perfect, this type of talk would get you killed back then. <laughs> this is blasphemy, according to the Jewish tradition, the Jewish law. Me telling you that Jesus was enough to make you perfect? Whew. You're telling me I don't have to go back to the temple at the annual day of atonement to receive forgiveness by way of animal blood? You're telling me that all this work that the Levitical priests are doing 
is now obsolete? That they can rest? You're telling me that the blood of Jesus, of this man, this carpenter, is greater than this grandiose temple that Solomon built? You gotta be kidding me. Do you see why the author didn't even sign this letter? They were scared. This would have got the the Jewish this would have got the Jewish Sanhedrin to hunt them down and kill them. So they didn't sign it. So you are sanctified only by one way, and that is through the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus sanctifies you and it only does it once so he's already done it past tense that made you perfect now in your identity that is who you are so from a state of rest in your identity this begins to make sense good morning to you good morning how are you good i'm what are you making a video or something i'm doing a live All right, so there's a couple different sections of scripture I wanted to go over today that many people will use to rebut what I'm saying. And the first thing is what Paul said in 1 Timothy. He said, I am the chief of sinners. Now, if we look at this section of scripture, this will be normally the first thing that they'll say is, even Paul said he's a sinner. We are not sinners. We are saints. Saints means sanctified one. Does that make sense now? You have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Okay. So we are no longer sinners, but saints. So when you read a section of scripture that is describing someone who is sinful, it is not describing you, Christian. If you've believed in Christ for salvation, you have been sanctified. What would cause you to not be sanctified any longer? Sinful actions and attitudes? No, because Christ is not offering his blood again and again. You're, now you are a saint who's doing things that aren't saintly, but that doesn't make you not a saint. You're still a saint, but you're sinning. We still sin. I'm gonna get back to First Timothy in a second. But there was a guy on my TikTok the other day and he was dead set on convincing every single person who commented that Christians can't sin. Christians can sin. We sin all the time, every day. That doesn't mean we are sinners though. We are saints who occasionally sin. There's a difference as opposed to a sinner who sins, which is natural. You are perfect, you are holy, you are righteous, you are blameless. So that sinning, the sinful actions and attitudes, it's never gonna set right with you permanently. You can go a hundred years living your life, struggling with the same sin, even being in denial about the same sin, but you know, you're a saint, you're holy, you've been sanctified, you're a new creation. Christian sin, we all stumble in many ways. James chapter three. If any of you does sin, first John two. So when we look at the uh, chief of sinners passage, Paul is not describing who he now is even though he is telling this in a present tense story. He is saying a past present story. This is the same author who tells us we are righteous in 2 Corinthians 5, the same author who tells us we are blameless, holy, complete to the Colossians. Same author who says your old self died. Romans 6, Galatians 2, Colossians 2. So he is telling a story in the present tense of something from the past. This would be the same as, and we hear this all the time, a guy walks into the bar, a guy walks into the bar and then something happens in the story. Did the guy already walk into the bar? Yeah, he's not walking into the bar as you tell the story. Do you see that? So it's the same thing. So when Paul says, whom I'm, I am the chief of sinners, He's describing his past life as a persecutor of the church in order to expose the greatest level of grace that God can pour out. Imagine this guy. He was going from city to city, hunting down Christians, having them drug out into the streets, killing them. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine the uh, guilt he felt after he finally discovered the truth? 
So he's saying, I'm the worst of the worst. I'm the chief of the sinners. And then keep reading. He talks about God's grace. He's saying, if God can show me grace, he can show anybody grace. That's why Jesus recruited Paul. Jesus recruited Paul because this was his worst enemy. <laughs> this is, you, you can't plan this stuff. He didn't pick the, the Pharisees. He didn't pick those who thought they were righteous by what they were doing. He didn't pick the, the well-behaved um, law followers. Who did he pick? He picked a bunch of fishermen few women and Paul and me look at me <laughs> I could say the same thing about myself and that used to be what my ministry is built on talking bad about myself false humility I'm not perfect I'm just a drunk who talks about Jesus I'm not a drunk I'm a saint who struggled with alcoholism that's why I don't insult myself anymore because I know I'm perfect if I got on here and I said to you all these bad things about myself and then I talked about Jesus that's false humility that's that's belittling what Christ has done what did he do he has made me perfect by one offering by his blood I'm exactly like Jesus right now and so are you in this world you are like him first John 4 so we don't want to get into the habit of mistaking what we do with who we are, because then, yeah, you're gonna talk bad about yourself. You're gonna say all these bad things all the time, talk about all your mistakes, and oh, well, I'm just not perfect, but this time I'm just gonna give it my best shot. Today, I'm really gonna read my Bible a lot. I'm gonna be at every church service. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shine the shoes of my pastor I'm going to do everything I possibly can to serve the Lord. Is that going to make you perfect? No, friend, it's not. You're already perfect. You're already perfect. You could rest. You can live your life. You can make some mistakes. You're not your mistakes. You're holy. You're blameless. One of the number one rebuttals I get is... Be holy because God is holy. That is what we are. He's saying the same thing. Peter's saying the same thing. You're holy like God, so be yourself. Be yourself. You are perfect. The blood of Jesus has sanctified you. The blood of Jesus has made you perfect in your identity. So that's 1 Timothy 1. Now let's go over to the other section of scripture that a lot of people will try to use as proof text to prove me wrong about you not being perfect. And what's really sad is when this happens and I get attacked, I just feel for them. I feel for them because I know that if they're trying to put that difficult standard on me, that's the standard they have on themselves, themselves. And they can't live up to it. They don't have that ability. They're struggling. And what I'm saying about them being perfect goes against that struggle. But you can rest, friend. You can rest. Christ came to give you rest. He didn't save you so that you can do more stuff to earn your salvation, sustain your salvation, sustain your supernatural perfection, you have been sanctified. We see it in Hebrews 10. We see it in 1 Corinthians 6. You have been sanctified, past tense. What is the only thing that can sanctify you? The blood of Jesus, not what you do. If anybody could possibly do something to sanctify themselves, it would have been the Jews at the temple, and even they couldn't do it. So you're not doing anything to sanctify yourself. What are you going to do? Stop drinking, smoking, cussing, going to the club, sleeping with your girlfriend? What? All those things are going to have to be dealt with because you are sanctified. What are you going to do? Go to church more? Go to seminary? Study scripture harder? Get more followers? Do you see it? None of those things can sanctify you. 
really dive deep into your Bible, break down every single scripture, there's no life in that. Life is in Christ and you have him. So because we're sanctified, all of those things can revolve around that and the Holy Spirit from within us can teach us, can mature us, can help us understand you are perfect because you're perfect. Now be, now live, mature, grow. So let's go back to Romans chapter seven. Romans chapter seven is in a weird spot in Romans, but I get it. I see what Paul was doing. So when we look at Romans, he begins the first uh, four or five chapters of Romans describing all of humanity's problem apart from faith in Christ, both the Jew and the Gentile. He rips into the Jews and he says, if you're going to do the law, don't just be a hearer. You need to do all of it. <laughs> and then we have the Gentiles and were they doing that? No. That's why he said it. That's what the law's use was for, was to expose your need for grace, to increase sin so that sin would increase. Romans chapter five, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is every human being who has ever lived, who has never believed in Christ. This is not a Christian. It's another proof text that they like to use. Yeah, all, all have fallen short. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we need Jesus. So that verse in Romans chapter three is describing an unbeliever. So he talks about the Jews. You're not very good at following the law because you gotta be perfect. Then he talks to the Gentiles. You never had the law, but the righteous requirements of the law is written on your conscience. You have to be perfect. Be perfect like God is perfect. He said that in Matthew chapter five. So the Jew and the Gentile are both without excuse apart from faith in Christ, they're all born in Adam by no fault of their own, but by no work of their own and by no fault of Jesus, you could be reborn in Christ if you would believe in him. So there's the first five chapters. Then in uh, chapter six, we see Paul's description of our old self dying, being buried, and then placed into Christ. We've been placed into Christ. We've died to sin, to the power of sin. And we've been placed into Christ. And when he talks about uh, baptism, the word water isn't used one time. He's talking about being placed in his spirit, in the spirit of Jesus. That's true spiritual baptism. And then we got Romans chapter seven. Romans chapter seven. It's like all of a sudden, Paul says all this stuff. And then we get to Romans chapter seven. And it looks like he just starts saying that he's just a miserable, wicked, old, nasty sinner. <laughs> That's not the context. <laughs> It's almost like he's writing all these things. And then he's like, oh, I remember how bad it was when I tried to follow the law. Sin afforded through the commandment. He's describing his past life. Miserable man that I am. Again, telling it in a present tense story. Is Paul miserable? Is that the Christian life? So you can be saved to be miserable? No, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. So he's describing his inability to follow the law of Moses, namely thou shalt not covet. What's that? It's one of the 10 commandments. <laughs> Ooh, Sunday schools tables would flip. Little children are taught to follow the 10 commandments. But what did Paul say? Sin afforded through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. Miserable man that I am. I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do. Why? Because he's trying to follow the law. So just like in 1 Timothy 1 in Romans chapter 7, he is explaining his past life as a devout follower of the law. Miserable man that I am, what can I do? What's the answer? Keep reading. Romans 8, 1. What's it say? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He's in Christ. Do you see that? So we have to read Romans in context from front to back. So Romans chapter seven is not the normal Christian life. Romans chapter seven is Paul describing what life is like under the law. 
He even says the previous chapter, Romans chapter six, sin will no longer be your master because you're not under law, but under grace. That makes sense? Hope it does. All right. There's one or two other topics in regard to this subtopic in regard to this live I wanted to talk about. I am scanning my brain. All right. Oh, I know what it was. <laughs> let's let's do the opposite of this. Let's do the opposite. Let's say let's say you're not perfect. You're not perfect. You're not perfect. What's that do? What's that do to you? What's that do to your mind? I can tell you what it does for me. Two different things. Number one, it ticks me off. It makes me angry. Who do you think you are? Talking bad about me. Who do you think you are? I sin less than you. I go to church more than you. I got more followers on social media than you. I talk bad about myself more than you in order to show my amazing humility. Let me tell you how humble I am. How dare you say I'm not perfect? That's number one. Because when you don't know who you are, then you start to gauge what level. Oh, I might be perfect. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not. I got to get more followers. Oh, I lost followers. Oh, I, I messed up. I watched some porn. Oh, your perfection level. Do you see that? That's not the gospel. It make you angry. It makes you angry. It makes me angry. When somebody says, you're not perfect. I mean, not now because I know, but before I knew, man, that was, that was fighting words. And then you strive harder, work more, do more stuff, really try to get a lot of views this time. I'm gonna put on a tie and look good. Maybe even a coat to get the older crowd in here. You won't be yourself. I'm, I'm talking about Jesus in sleeveless, in a sleeveless cutoff shirt on Sunday. This is who I am. But if I didn't know who I was, I wouldn't do this. You might be able to even get a peek at my nipple. Do you see what I'm saying? This is who I am. But if I didn't know who I was, 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 I want to get this in your head. Know who you are, Christian. I know I'm perfect. <laughs> that's, that's hard to hear for some. I'm not talking about what I do. I'm not talking about my actions and attitudes. I'm talking about my identity. Me. My supernatural DNA. Because I know what made me perfect. The blood of Jesus. And Jesus will never pour out his blood again. It's finished. He did it once. He's not going to do it again. I've received it. And it made me perfect. It made me perfect. I received it. I didn't reach out and grab it. It's not... <laughs> we receive it. We say thank you. By no effort of your own. You believed. And then what's the other thing that would happen? And I'm going to try not to get choked up on this. When you don't know that, you're, that you are perfect, what else happens?
Give up. You continue in that addiction. You continue to allow that abuse. You ignore Jesus. You don't express who you are because you're confused. So you give up. Give up on your relationship with God. I'm just a nasty sinner anyway. I'm just a stupid drunk. I'm a pervert. I'm a cheat. I'm a liar. There's nothing good in me. gone down that road too I've done both when I didn't know I was perfect tried harder to be perfect couldn't do it gave up lived a very licentious life who cares anyway I'm not perfect anyway tired of it I was tired of it anger anger happens you, you cannot unconvince me of this now because I know the truth I am perfect but I don't always express my perfection you are perfect Christian but you don't always express your perfection that I mean that's the, the, that's who you are now the good news is, and I think I'm back now, <laughs> had some old feelings popping up. Uh, the good news is, even when I was ignoring Jesus and I gave up on expressing who I am because I didn't think that I was perfect, he stayed with me. He was committed to me. He never left me. He doesn't come and go. I was already perfect. I'd been perfect since I was a little boy when I believed. He didn't he didn't leave me when I did all that stuff. He went with me. We're one spirit. I I had died. And I was hidden in him. Hidden in God with him. We're one. We are united. So this is the truth that you have to deal with when you say I can't be perfect anyway. So I'm just going to A, B, and C. Perfection is what you already have because of Christ. So if you think you're scrubbing your life in order to be perfect, you'll never receive that. You'll never achieve that. The Jews couldn't even do that. So what, what do you do in order to understand? Let's go ahead and and wrap this up. What do you do in order to understand your supernatural perfection? What do you do? Your, your perfection, period. All three parts of you are holy. Spirit, soul, and body. Not just your spirit. There's nothing wrong with your flesh either. Your flesh is holy. Paul tells the Thessalonians that. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. The flesh is the issue. And that's a whole other topic. But you are not the flesh. You do not have a sinful nature. You have old coping mechanisms, old thought processes, immaturities, but that's not you. Okay. So 
What should you do in order to understand that you are perfect? What? Rest, 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 rest. Again, this is hard for the religious mind because the religious mind wants you to think I'm saying be lazy. I'm not. Don't worry. The Holy Spirit will motivate you to do stuff. But whether you do it or not do it is not going to cause you to maintain your perfection or achieve your perfection. Rest. Okay? Rest. Rest in who you already are. Anytime you have the thought that you've done something which could cause you to no, no longer be perfect, remember the cross. You have to go back to what perfected you. What perfected you? Did, did your actions and attitudes ever perfect you? Negative. Your faith did. Your one-time faith. Don't put faith in your faith. Some people think, I gotta continue in the faith. Paul was talking about the message. Your faith accessed your salvation once. Don't put faith in your faith. Please. My faith is not bigger than yours. Yours isn't bigger than mine. Jesus talked a lot about faith because he was trying to expose who he was. It's going to take a lot of faith for them to believe he is who he says he is. You've believed. They've believed. Don't put faith in your faith. Rest. Rest. Remember the cross. Remember who you are. Remember that one offering. Remember that you have been sanctified. Remember the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Remember that it's finished. Remember Hebrews chapter 1. Remember Hebrews chapter 10. Remember John 19. Remember everything that Jesus has done. Remember Jesus. Jesus is how I can tell you that you are perfect. Jesus. You'll never hear me give you a behavior improvement walk talk. Why? Because if our righteousness could be attained through behavior improvement, Christ died for nothing. So it can't. So let's not focus on actions and attitudes. Let's focus on identity. The actions and attitudes are a byproduct of understanding your identity. Get your identity right first. Know who you are. And then you'll see change in your life. But that change will not sustain or improve your identity. You have been sanctified. All right, guys. So I hope this has encouraged you today. Always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're perfect, Christian. And if you have believed in Christ for salvation one time in your entire life, you are a Christian. You are a child of God. You are a perfect. You're no longer a servant. Jesus no longer calls you a servant. What a mighty God we serve. I'm not saying that serving isn't a good thing, but some people find their identity in how good they serve. Jesus even said, I no longer call you servants, but friends, you are a friend of God. Jesus served you. That's the truth. Tell the truth about yourself. Jesus served you. Deal with it. <laughs> Tell the truth. You're a saint. You're sanctified. You're holy. You're blameless. You're righteous. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. You can't mess this up. The hope that anchors your soul is the promise that was made between my back is the promise. The hope that anchors your soul is the promise 
that the Father and the Son made at the cross by two unchangeable parties. The Father and the Son. They can't lie. You can. How can you lie? By saying you're doing something to maintain your salvation. By saying, by saying you're doing something to continually be sanctified in what you do. They can't lie. So you benefited from their promise. You benefited from their covenant. The promise keepers conventions. That's, that's a 20th century, 21st century Judaism. What did the Jews say at the base of Mount Sinai once Moses brought the law down? We will do everything written in the book of the law. Moses, we will do everything. We promise. And what did they do? Making a golden idol before the ink had even dried. It's not about your promises to God. We are terrible promise keepers. Thankfully, they are not. Thankfully, the father and son are great promise keepers. All right, guys, hope you've enjoyed today's walk talk. If you want to go deeper into any of my teachings, you can always go to my website. You can type any particular Bible topic that you're looking for, and I've probably written about it. You can read it for free. Um, sign up for my daily email. I send out an email every morning that might encourage you as well. All right, guys, I hope you have a blessed day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.